Welcome, everyone, to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Coming at you all the way live from somewhere in the Central Coast. And I want to get right down to it because Pascal and I have both crafted a ton of questions for our guest today. Our returning guest, for those uh, new people to the show, even before Pascal was on the show and it was just strictly an audio-only podcast, Randy Shaw has been on the show because I worked uh, in housing and with the unhoused and have always loved uh, what Randy has to say. He's been a longtime activist in that world and has wrote several books and papers about it. So without any further ado, let me bring in my homie, my dog, Mr. Pascal Robert. Yeah. <laughs> what a way to start the show. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. My setup is not ergonomically correct for the board. So that's why you get less sound effects now. I understand. Lucky for you. It's okay. And I probably need to close this window as my neighbors are screaming at the ball game. Are you ready for today's show? Yes, I am. Well, we had Randy on with you. Was it just me and you and Randy once? Yeah, we had Randy, Randy Shaw on before with me and you. You had him on You had him on when you were this audio, but he was on with the both of us once before as well. So I'm excited that he gets to come back as the show is bigger, the audience is bigger, more people get to hear what he's got to say. So chat if you have any questions for Randy, and I think you guys will. Uh, we're going to be doing a call-in for the bonus patron after hours segment. So if you guys have some real pressing stuff you want to get at, we'll take your calls. You know the rules. Got to pay for this shit by the second, so you got two minutes to get that shit off your chest. Now... We made a video, as we usually do, to get you guys ready for this. And in this video, I found uh, some really good raw footage of Ronald Reagan on the campaign trail before he became president in 1980 in the Bronx. And it's an amazing exchange because I don't know if you would see this level of exchange now. Can you imagine a, a modern day candidate doing something like this now, Pascal? No. <laughs> So Ronald Reagan is kind of, this is before you get shot, of course. So Ronald Reagan is just there in the Bronx in, uh, in front of kind of the ashes of a, of a torn down building. And all these residents are just yelling at him to the point where he gets frustrated. It's like 20 minutes long. I, I wish I could play the whole thing for you because the whole 20 minutes is just full of gems from the people and Reagan. But ultimately, Reagan is explaining to these people that the answer to their problems is him giving tax breaks to private business and bringing in industry. Um, and then I, you'll see, you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it. I don't know that the Clan has endorsed you. Well, I can tell you, I don't endorse them. Mr. Reagan, please. I got a question for you. But you have, I, I got you. I heard your question. Let me, let me try to answer. Listen. Wait a minute. Please cool it down. Cool it. Your man got something to say. Cool it. Will you hold it down? On the count of, I'm getting pretty hoarse. Nineteen twenty-eight was a good building year. Almost three billion dollars worth of new residential construction saw the light of day. But in nineteen twenty-nine, even before the depression became general, building dropped off to slightly under two billion. Year after year, throughout the depression, this decline continued. Each succeeding drop meaning thousands more men laid off in the building and allied industries. Until in nineteen thirty-four, all of the new homes built in the United States were worth only two hundred and twenty-seven million dollars. 
a decline of 92 percent from 1928. But due to the stimulation of the National Housing Act, 1935 presents a different picture. From every section of the country come reports of vastly increased building activity. After the economic shock of the COVID pandemic, homelessness and affordable housing was becoming a major issue in many blue cities and states across the country. With the eviction moratorium lifted, what protections do poor and working class people have to stave off homelessness in gentrifying cities? A recent U.S. Census Bureau household poll survey is estimating we could have 4.3 million Americans evicted and foreclosed on in the coming months. Will the Biden Build Back Better infrastructure bill be enough to curb this potential homelessness crisis? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. I am sending Congress a plan that will give every responsible homeowner in America the chance to save about $3,000 a year on their mortgage by refinancing at historically low rates. No more red tape. No more run around from the banks. And a small fee on the largest financial institutions will make sure it doesn't add to our deficit. Now, I want to be clear, this plan, like the other actions we've taken, will not help the neighbors down the street who bought a house they couldn't afford and then walked away and left a foreclosed home behind. It's not designed for those who acted irresponsibly, but it can help those who acted responsibly. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe on your way out. You can, can count. That's true. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Do it now, please. All right. That being said, without any further ado, he is the man that wrote the book that unfortunately is at my dad's. I to read by that shit. So I bought two copies, Randy. The author of Generation Priced Out, longtime housing rights activist. Please welcome. Randy Shaw. Yeah. Thank you for again having me, Jason. A great, great video to start the show. I, I'm glad you. I'm glad you like it. Glad you like it. Uh, took longer than people think combing through uh, footage about housing with Reagan and Barack Obama. <laughs> And I've also found that newsreel clip from 1939 about the uh, New Deal housing, which was pretty cool. Well, we're happy to have you here. Uh, I, I'm sure the chat is going to blow up with a bunch of questions once we start asking our questions. Did you want to go first, Pascal? Or you want me to go first? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take us. I'll take uh, Randy to a place of questioning. Okay. So, Randy, I want to ask you. I mean, in reading your book and the articles. Uh, particularly the one on the recent election in California, I sense, particularly from your book, that there is an increasing amount of activism around housing that you are recording in your book early on that you would know better than I as a longtime housing activist has been unseen uh, in American history. Uh what do you think are the driving forces behind this growth in housing activism? And do you think the race and class makeup of the current wave of housing activists are going to be able to target the problem of racialized gentrification that we see in many urban areas affecting black and brown communities? Well, that's a big question. Let me just start with why I think there's been a big increase in housing activism. I mean, the, re the increase really started in response to the second dot-com boom that began like in 2015, where rents and housing prices in every major city were going up. And that displaced people, caused people been unable to afford housing where they wanted to live. They had to move further away from their jobs. And then we had on top of that, the COVID eviction crisis involving millions. So we have a combination of an eviction crisis due to COVID, un mass unemployment, 
with rising rents in, in, in blue cities, which I talk about in my book. And so, I mean, I, I was saying before the show how critical I was of Barack Obama for not making even a, an attempt to fund a solution to homelessness in 2009 when Democrats controlled the entire legislature. It wasn't even an attempt to do so in 2009, 2010. So there's no, no, can't blame Republicans for that. Uh, we didn't have the infrastructure at the national level. It was pre, put a pre-internet where people were really connected. Uh, since really 2000, the start of the primaries and the Democratic primaries in 2020, housing has been a front burner issue more than it's ever been in any presidential primary year ever. And Biden's Build Back Better plan is the greatest investment in housing we've seen since the New Deal. And, you know, when that plan was announced, I was saying, you know, this is the first time in my lifetime, and really in anybody's lifetime, that we have a chance to end homelessness, meaningfully end homelessness, most homelessness in America. But as we've known since that time was announced, there's been cutbacks. And I just got a, you know, Twitter's been a great resource to get updated information. There was a delegation of uh, elected Congress members who met with the White House today. I assume the president, because says the White House. I just got a report 30 minutes ago that there's no assurance that any of the 207 billion targeted additional 207 billion targeted to deal with the housing crisis is going to be included in the final bill. So everyone listening from around the country, if you haven't caught, if your Congress member and Senator are already on board, aren't already on board, it's not that they don't say they support it. You have to tell them don't back any bill that doesn't include the housing funds. And it is multiracial, obviously, in the leadership. I mean, this is what makes it more potent. And I think this is one of the reasons why Biden included all this money in his bill, because I think the Congressional Black Caucus was very clear in the Latino Caucus that they needed, their communities needed this money. So I don't even want to think about what happens if we don't get the money that we thought we were going to get, because uh, the lobbying has been, the, the activism has been there. So based on your analysis, Biden is breaking the traditional kind of neoliberal consensus that we've seen for over 45, going back, as we said on the show, the 50 plus year counter revolution to actually try to put a major uh, affordable housing plan in this Build Back Better bill. Do you think that because that's a result of reacting to the crisis post COVID? Or would you attribute that to the level of activism or a combination of both? It's probably a combination. I mean, I know Elizabeth Warren, who was really pro-housing in the primaries and really pushed for this big amount of money, was very influential with Biden to get him to do it. But the, you know, what's so frustrating, Pascal and Jason, is that I run across people all the time where you see this online where people say, well, you know, all these activists keep saying it's a money issue. If it were a money issue, it would have been solved right now. Well, no, we never got the money. Homelessness began. You know, it all started when Nixon got us out of the public housing business in the mid-70s. Reagan then decimated the HUD budget, and the HUD budget was never restored to 80, 1980 levels. And then people act like it was. Like, well, the problem wouldn't have existed this much if it was just money. Well, when you never get the money, the problem gets worse. And every year, more and more families are unable to afford market rents in the cities. So uh, this was an opportunity to really reverse course for America. And we have to, the time is now to keep the pressure up. And then 125 Congress members signed a letter urge saying they're not going to support a bill without it. So we have a leadership, a lot of it coming out of New York City, people of color. And uh, uh, so it's a very diverse coalition. Do, do you, uh, when you talk about the Department of Housing and Urban Development, what exactly has been their particular role in the overall trajectory of housing policy, would you argue, from the rise of uh, Nixon, Nixon going forward? And, and I, wanted, I wanted to add to I wanted to add to that uh, question as well, Pascal. Uh, you you say in your book in the new preface, the rise of homelessness. You say begins around uh, 1980. It starts to get really bad and overblown. Excuse me with the uh, with with the Reagan administration. So what? is the cause of that 
And as Pascal is asking, HUD plays a massive role because HUD has been underfunded, um, as you talk about, from every president <laughs> from 1980 to now. HUD has constantly been uh, underfunded and also have had well, some horrible heads. Not to oversimplify what many believe is a complex uh, question, but the reality is this. We had a lot of drug addiction in the 60s, alcohol addiction, sub mental health problems. We didn't have a homeless problem in the 60s. Why is that? Because low-income people who had substance abuse problems or had mental health problems could afford rent in New York City, San Francisco, you know, cities that now seem, you know, by the late 1970s, a phenomenon developed where young people known as yuppies moved back to the cities after growing up in the suburbs. And so suddenly real city urban real estate was rising in value and just when and pricing out the low-income population. And just when those low-income tenants needed Section 8 vouchers and needed government subsidies, we elect Ronald Reagan, who decimates the HUD budget in 1981. So there was a catastrophic decision made. I'm sorry to report, Democrats controlled the House in 1981. They could have stopped that cut. They didn't. And it's never been recovered. We've never had a president until now who said, you know, I'm going to put the kind of money. We've had... Clinton and Obama, you know, they appoint good people to HUD, very good people to HUD, but there's no money, it doesn't matter how good you are. And then, of course, Republicans come in and they cut the budget and bring in terrible people like, like Trump did and what Bush did, you know, people who don't even have any interest in housing to begin with. So it's a heads it's been a heads I win, tails you lose uh, situation. Another question I wanted to ask you, Randy, was one of the things that you make clear in your book is that basically housing is one of those housing and affordable housing, affordable housing issues is one of those policy concerns that we have that is very locally driven in terms of politics and policy. And you also talk about how, as a consequence of that, municipal ele elections or have a much more significant role in determining housing policy than many people would be aware of in certain cities. In the wake of this kind of new contemporary left that we have post-2015, as you're talking about, how exactly can a political strategy be developed to affect municipal governing agencies and political bodies to literally put in government officials who put the rights of working class people first to implement housing policy that can counter some of the noxious turns in gentrification and high and high price housing that we're seeing in urban centers from New York to California and all over the country. Do you think there's a certain strategy that can be implemented to counteract particularly the influence of the real estate in municipal governance? And by the way, I, I see someone asking which one of my books, they're talking about Generation Priced Out, who gets to live in the new urban America, our paperback edition. Uh, in my book, I say one of the first steps, if you want to get more ten more power for tenants, is to change elections so they coincide with national and state elections instead of local elections. In the first week of November, Boston, Cambridge, Boulder, Seattle are holding major elections off year. Now in, in Seattle, it's a bail, it's a mail in ballot, which helps, but don't you think there'd be a lot more tenants and people and working class residents of color voting if it were tied in with the state and national election than a November 2021 election? Uh, LA tra finally changed. LA's politics were very hostile to, to new development until they changed the election cycle, which started in 2020. But, uh, you know, we have a major election, like I would say in Seattle, I don't know if anyone here is not listening to, from Seattle, but we have a huge election where Lorena Gonzalez, if she wins to become the first mayor of, of uh, Latino mayor in, of uh, Seattle, I mean, she would totally change this, the world for the city's low income residents in, in a positive way. Her opponent would change would keep it the way it is. So some of these elections are really important. Uh, but as a political strategy, deciding to have off year elections is disempowering. And 
uh, the turnouts just aren't what they otherwise would be. And the people who disproportionately vote are white homeowners in these low turnout elections. Right. And one of the things that I found really fascinating about your suggestion, you make this point very clear in your book, is that one of your most important suggestions for addressing affordable housing crisis, particularly gentrification, and I'd really like you to elaborate this, this strategy, is to basically end a single family uh, zoning laws. Single family housing. Well, yeah, you know, it's it's been a battle in California. We finally just did it and allowed duplexes. But, you know, people have people who don't seem to a lot of people don't think of anything that gets built as evil developers building housing. But the reality is, is in most of Los Angeles, which has the worst homeless problem in the United States, you can't build an apartment building for homeless people in most neighborhoods. San Francisco can't solve its homeless problem without changing existing zoning. I don't think any city can, because when you ban luxury apartments you're banning all apartments and we've allowed austin all the cities i talk about in my book we've allowed all these progressive cities to have vast stretches of the city where there's no tenants allowed well that's let, madness I, I, well i want i want to get on that because you know there is a, a kind of thought process on some people People mostly you see it on the online left where they say, I'm done with electoral politics. No one can do anything. Uh, there's someone in the chat uh, who who uh, is talking about the mayoral race that you're speaking on doesn't matter because Amazon is too powerful. I mean, I would definitely challenge them with Kashama Sawant, who won a city council, who's, who's won multiple times our city council seat going against uh, those two behemoths that spent millions against the city council members. So, I mean, things can't well, happen. And she has made changes in, in certain in housing. So again, anyone in Seattle who thinks that it doesn't matter who's mayor, just ask yourself, if Seattle had elected Carrie Moon over Jenny Durkin four years ago, what a different city Seattle would be today. I don't think anyone can dispute that. So mayoral elections mean a lot. But, but getting into electoral politics and kind of getting into the weeds of what you talk about a lot in your book, a lot of what you say that is that is causing gentrification and holding up building of housing is policy sb50 uh that's that uh, state senator scott weiner was was trying to pass it didn't pass and now we have uh, was it sb9 and sb10 um that would allow uh multi-unit uh housing to be built in single family residences and there's a massive pushback uh to do that um what role uh, does electoral politics play in a place like California, for example, where you have well, a state assembly that's kind of captured by the, the real estate uh, lobby? Well, to electoral area. politics, that, that you hit, your, but your last statement is really the essence in that uh, electoral politics, you know, when someone says I don't mean electoral politics, then they're not really going to be involved in housing policy because it's all done by elected officials. Uh, and so... But I find that people I know get very frustrated with California state's government. They see it as has a super majority of Democrats, but it's owned by the real estate industry for the most part. And what you get is around the edges. It's amazing we've gotten what we've gotten given how the real estate industry. And the problem we have is that in many states, like in California, realtors are in every assembly district. There's always a real estate office in every multiple ones in every assembly district, but there aren't active tenant groups in every assembly district, right? Like the Central Valley yeah. parts. And so uh, there's always lobbyists for real estate. And when you elect people who feel like there's no one in their district who cares about rent control, but there's a lot of people who oppose it, they're not going to be voting with your way at the state level. So it's understandably frustrating why people feel like electoral politics don't work. But in housing policy, that decides where we go with money. And had we not elected Ronald Reagan, we probably would never have had a homeless problem. And that's a big statement, but a big I statement. believe if we kept the original budget, if Carter won that election, mm -hmm. we would have expanded Section 8 instead of killing it. What do you think about that, Pascal? I mean, I, I'm not going to make the argument that electoral politics is irrelevant, but I mean, the fact that, you know, housing is something in which you're dealing with budgetary constraints that you're dealing with the government. I mean, it absolutely makes sense that how are you going to address a housing crisis if you're not dealing with, you know, political officials that are willing to allocate resources to doing that? That absolutely makes sense. 
But the question that I ask is that how do you deal with the reality where particularly in these municipalities or in a state situation like California, you have the real estate industry and the real estate lobbies that have so much power. For example, I'm from New York City. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways that I, one of the things that I find particularly uh, noxious about uh, urban real estate planning and development, particularly around issues of gentrification and so on and so forth, is how members of the black political class in these cities are able to use racial allegiance of the urban uh, population to win elections. Yet at the same time, there is not a a municipal city in America that did not have a black mayor at the time some of the worst gentrification policies were being implemented in this country. And I think about right now the situation in New York with Eric Adams, who is the new mayor, who is being celebrated by not only the black political class, but many black citizens as the resurgence of black authority, black political authority in New York City. This guy got more money from the real estate development lobby than any other candidate in New York City. Well, Pascal, you, 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 this is for a separate show, but you make a really great point that people haven't talked about enough, which is that working class people, brown and black voters in New York City voted, put him in office. Mm-hmm. They elected him, even though he's a real estate person. You know, Bill de Blasio was a huge real estate recipient, huge. And people wonder why his housing policy hired a gold, Bill, as I say in the book, Goldman Sachs, he hired a Goldman Sachs person to be the director of housing. Bill de Blasio, Mr. Progressive, hired a Goldman Sachs person. And we say, well, how can that be? Well, he was a major recipient of real estate funds in his campaign, even though he was the progressive candidate. So one thing New York City did, though, the activists in New York City, through the Working Families Party, in 2018, went up and changed the election map of New York and elected a state Senate, got rid of the conservative Democrats, primaried them all, and then at the state level, totally strengthened rent control and tenant protection. So New York is an example of what could happen. Uh, we can't seem to do that in California. It, it's it's a lot harder because of just the dynamics of state and how we have so many people living in places like the Central Valley as opposed to big cities. But uh, I personally am involved in trying to get legislation for tenants through the California legislature. And let me tell you, it is difficult. It is challenging. And you deal with people who are Democrats, who are backed by labor, get all their funding from labor. Labor is 100% labor score. They're with real estate. Um, We had a candidate on this show that was running in Oakland, uh, Janani Rishandaran. Fantastic. I endorsed her and gave her money. She's fantastic. Um, And I think she was the only person that would have been, if if elected, and sadly she didn't win, uh, if elected, I think she would have been the only person that rented. The yes, there's no the renters in the legislature. Oh, there's two renters. I mean, you know, we wonder why we have problems. And, you know, we do have many, many very great legislators in California and other states, but real estate is everywhere in this state. And uh, it's hard. But, uh, you know, the stuff at the local level, it doesn't explain why cities that don't have that, you know, cities, you can have more power on rent control. You can enact your own rent control laws in cities in, outside of Massachusetts where they ban it, you know, and, and actually, I don't know if you people realize in roughly 40 states, cities can't enact rent control, even though that's an essential affordability solution. That's the problem Seattle has. Portland went up there and they got a state exemption. Oregon totally changed everything. But Seattle cannot enact rent control unless the state legislature authorizes it. Isn't that crazy? And the state legislature. All the rents, high rents in Seattle. I mean, that it, what's what's crazy is like these state legislature elections also happen with very, very low voter turnout. And many of these things, ha- these laws, anti-rent control laws are passed like 30 years ago when we didn't have rent. Seattle wasn't an expensive city then. Yeah. But, you know, uh, Seattle is an interesting point because I do think I see a lot of comments about Seattle on the, on the chat room that uh, if you take a step back, Seattle was moving in the direction of San Francisco in terms of being progressive and by electing the wrong mayor and there was a great council candidate they didn't elect and the sort of homeowner influence has halted the city's progress and hopefully Lorena Gonzalez will win in, in November. 
In your book, you speak to a YIMBY movement, which would be the antithetical to the NIMBY movement. Uh, but there is some critique of the YIMBY movement as well. Uh, well, I just got into a fight with just... San Francisco YIMBY because there was a project in the Tenderloin that we opposed. And, uh, you know, people well, can you tell us about the project and why you opposed it. Yeah, it's a pro it's a project. It was a 172 unit family housing project, which we totally supported. And all of our residents of the Tenderloin were supportive. Then after it got approved, the owner of the building changed the developer, redesigned the project. So it was a 316 group housing units without kitchens and no family, virtually no family units at all. So we said, wait a minute, we wanted family housing. Our neighborhood has thousands of kids. They have no place to live with suitable housing and they refused to budge. And so we all opposed it and people, tweeted to me and emailed me saying, I'm a hypocrite. I say I'm for housing, but I never say anywhere in my books, you should support every project a developer comes up with, as bad as it is. And so we, we Tenderloin Housing Clinic, which I'm the head of, appealed the approved, the planning commission approved the project four to two, and we appealed it to the board of supervisors. And a week and a half ago, we won 11 to zero. We stopped the project. And we had a powerful statement from the supervisors that we need family housing in the Tenderloin, not more housing for single adults. Now, you talk about uh, San Francisco has a few, quote unquote, progressives on their uh, city council. Even, we, even a board a of we are probably by the traditional definition of progressive, probably have the most progressive local government by the traditional definition. Oh, uh, just with Chase Boudin alone. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the challenge with San Francisco, which I talk about in my book, is that we have the strongest rent controls in the country. We have the strongest tenant protections. We have the strongest housing protections. We have the strongest laws, all these things. But the city is still super expensive because we don't build enough housing. I mean, that's the problem is that you, we have the, to be progressive in San Francisco has long meant I'm going to take care of the people who are here. The fact that working class people can no longer afford to live here isn't my problem. I think it should be. I think just if you're young and you're working in middle class, you should be able to live in San Francisco. And we shouldn't just have politics that only care about the existing population. Well, hasn't that been kind of a push for some of these strikes we've seen with teachers in places like Los Angeles and yes, Oakland exactly. to actually Los have Angeles. affordable housing in the in the cities they live in? I speak about this constantly. The L.A. Times has done some pretty good work about housing in California. But uh, a few years back, maybe like f seven years or so ago, the most expensive overbidding for a house in the state history was in Sunnyvale, California. It was like eight hundred and sixty five thousand dollars over asking for a three and a two. And Sunnyvale is just kind of your average suburban community, but there's still schools there. So where did the man, where does the mailman live? Where do the teachers, well, teachers live? in Sunnyvale they were sleep in their cars because they can't afford it's a three hour commute from where they can afford to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the society that we have created in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles. I have a chapter in my book on, on Los Angeles and generation priced out. And you have people living in converted garages because when you say you're going to live an hour away in Los Angeles, you know, people in the Bay Area think they have traffic. Visit L.A. on a commute day and you'll know what real traffic is. Yeah. And you and you talk about this in your book as well, that housing is also an environmental issue. And I know I know you mentioned this before the first time you were on the show, but there's a lot of new viewers now that, that didn't catch that episode. Can you get into why housing is an environmental issue as well? Well, when you make people, when you give people jobs in a city, but then you give them no place they can afford to live, they have to commute from a vast distance. You know, I talk about how many, the staggering number, 150,000 people were commuting from Sacramento to the Bay Area. Well, they're driving. That's like a two and a half to three hour drive. So people with, just with think of what that means. I once did a talk in, in, someone told me I did a talk in Fremont, which is in the South Bay. And, uh, person told me he works at UC Berkeley and he's in his group of 40 people he had in his little group at work work group in Berkeley none of them could afford to live in Berkeley so if you have people having to drive long distances Vacaville Fairfield that's terrible for the environment infill housing means you could just if we had Berkeley is crazy Berkeley is now changing politically but for a long time 
you couldn't build an apartment in most of Berkeley. The apartments you saw in Berkeley were built before the zoning change in the 60s. It's and was that largely because of the single family housing zoning zoning legislation? Yeah, and I discuss it in my book how Berkeley was founded. They had the first national, the first in the nation neighborhood preservation ordinance. And well-meaning people did it, but it was like neighborhood preservation means keep out apartments. And you know, they'd say they were too, they want they didn't want ticky tack apartments. And what I say in the book is, well, that's where probably the janitors at UC Berkeley could afford to live. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can afford a house. But if we're gonna not let apartments, you're basically saying. And it's racially driven, of course. That's why these neighborhoods that are single family zoned are heavily white in Berkeley, because people of color can't afford to live there. So, you know, when segregation laws ended in 1964, when we and then the Fair Housing Act of 66, communities came up with other creative ways to keep people of color out, and they chose zoning restrictions. In, in Austin, they have lot restrictions where you can't, you have to have a certain size lot to build. Well, that means you have to build a mansion. Who can afford to build a mansion? So the, the question becomes, is that in this reality, understanding that it takes a, long, a significant amount of understanding of housing policy, housing law, housing history, and understanding the, the role of the real estate developers in developing that history, how exactly do we work on growing the housing activist core and the people who can you know, most effectively fight the policies that are basically pushing this kind of, you know, housing crisis. We're looking about right now, we have, you know, head funds and asset holders like BlackRock that are buying up, you know, new not only apartment buildings, but, you know, new single families, sing, new single family housing all over the country. And it almost looks as if, and this has been going on since the 2008 crash. I remember even some of the banks out post crash were buying up a lot of these, uh, recently foreclosed properties. And it's looking more and more based on the movements of the financial institutions that we're almost moving to a kind of feudal society where no one's going to be able to not no no less rent, but even think about owning a home or anything of that nature. So how exactly, what exactly can be done to stem the tide of these, 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 these policies? Does it take a crisis like COVID? that causes the Democrats in Congress right now to wake up? Or, uh, you know, what, what exactly are some steps as a lot, lifelong housing activist do you think can be taken? You know, people ask me when I go to, when I do book events, like, why do you think these homeowners will change their view? And actually, I think there's been success in educating people who are not reactionary people. They consider themselves liberal Democrats that to explain to them why banning apartments is bad. And undermines I mean, they have a black lives matter sign in their door where they say to ban apartments the two don't really match and i think we're having success i mean you know you talk about the new mayor of new york the likely new mayor of new york city he supports affordable housing upper zoning soho an upscale neighborhood in new york city for affordable housing one thing that a lot of people have found common cause in is we can avoid the whole gentrification issue let's go to completely gentrified neighborhoods and build affordable housing how can you be against that and I think that's something there's a like Cambridge had 100 percent affordable housing overlay, which would allow you to build affordable housing in any neighborhood. Those are, and I think that gets people excited about real change. And I found I know Berkeley is, a, is, is a, only 100,000 people. It's not the best ideal example. But in Berkeley, it used to be you'd go to a land use hearing and the only people who spoke were the people opposed to a project. Politics changed and now students are mobilized and they come down and support projects that can house students and things. So it's really expanding the base. We have, we have had a silent, I think we've had a silent, large silent majority to allow apartments to be built everywhere, to not just limit apartments to a few neighborhoods in every city, but those people have not been engaged. They haven't come out. They don't get involved. And that's changing in cities all across America. So that's what I, you know, Chronicle and Generation priced out how that was all started. So I, I think there's reason for optimism, but also, as you point out, Pascal, the four and Jason, the forces of the status quo and of keeping every city rich and only for the rich are powerful. And, you know, if we were to lose this battle 
over the budget in Washington, I, I think it'd be very psychologically destructive because, I mean, if we can't get the money now, sure, we can try to convince people that, uh, okay, we have to change the Senate in two years, go vote. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who fought for this housing money and end homelessness are going to be very discouraged. And it, it was these these activists that uh, that fought that pushed hard for uh, Governor Gavin Newsom to do something during the early uh, stages of the COVID crisis. And we get uh, Operation Room Key, where money is given to uh, hotels and motels to those for to temporary temporarily shelter in place uh, our unhoused citizens. Of course, the uh, project did not work as well in Los Angeles. I definitely have my opinions about that. It worked a little better, in my opinion, in the Bay Area. Well, at least the East Bay and places like Oakland. Um, actually, down south in Fremont had had quite a few units. And some of the hotels uh, that were part of the project were higher in hotels like Marriott's. Um, I definitely worked at uh, the Radisson in, in East Oakland. But one thing I will say about these areas, they were in extremely depressed locations. Uh, the hotels that were not doing it were in the downtown areas. The Fairmont in San Francisco, for sure, was not was not doing it. Uh, neither was uh, the Four Seasons and all that other good stuff. But Well, you're raising an issue of segregation, which people don't like to talk about, but when you ban apartments from neighborhoods, you're, you're, you're basically having racial segregation. Yeah. And, but, and these are liberal cities. I, I say these, I say in my book, these blue cities all practice policies that are set to promote segregation, but they're progressive. So no one wants to look at them carefully, but I think it, that's changing. Uh, one thing about the project room key thing is San Francisco bought a hotel for homeless people that I'd been very involved with in the 1980s. It's called the Hotel Diva uh, on Geary Street yeah. in the square. And I know I it well. Off in, in, so in, Diva got, did Diva got bought in Room Key or yes. before Room Key? No. For wow. Room Key. Diva's I nice. I, it's a tourist hotel, but I was involved and the article, there was a New York Times article about it, which talks about my involvement. I, I was involved where all the tenants are facing eviction and they wanted to convert the hotel to tourist. And we stopped the eviction of all the tenants, got them all lifetime leases. Uh, which was great, but that hotel was allowed to convert the tourists when it never should have. And the city agency just let it be illegal, illegally let it be tourists. And it's really bothered me for the past 35 years that we lost the Diva Hotel and now we got it back. So I'm kind of happy about that. You can kind of reverse gentrify. The Diva, uh, Pascal, was the last time uh, I hung out with Biz Marquis and DJ Cool V. Oh, um, okay. They were staying or at Geary. The, it used to be the Summerton Hotel when I was involved. It it's I know the location. It's it's right smack dab in the middle of uh yeah. of uh uh I can't think right now. Square. David Square. Square. Oh, right there by Geary Street Theaters right there. It's right there. So the Diva is part of Room Key. That's interesting. You know, I see a comment about public housing. You know, one of the things that the Reagan budget particularly did was decimate public housing. And then we had Bill Clinton come in with his reform of public housing, which ended up saving public housing by demolishing over 100,000 family units. I wonder how many people listening to this show know that that happened under the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. uh, it was to save public housing. They claimed the units couldn't be salvaged, but we didn't replace them. In San Francisco, Willie Brown, of all people, made it sure that every unit was replaced one for one. We never lost a housing unit in San Francisco. Nationally, just think we lost a hundred thousand family housing units because that was how Bill Clinton wanted to fix Reform. public housing. So now there's an effort to build social housing in California. There's a bill to do it, to follow the European model. And let's hope that happens because obviously public housing is a more government funded housing, government owned housing is a more is can be more effect cost effective if it's done right. But if you don't fund it and it's done wrong, like America has done it wrong for the last 50 years, it's a disaster. Well, would you, would you both agree? This question is for, for Pascal and Randy. Would you both agree that for the most part, the way we view public, not we as the people on the show, but the way public housing is viewed is very punitive. Would you guys agree? Yes. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a class, there's a class outlook to the concept of public housing as well. It's like, you know, this is where the poor black and brown people are. Like you don't want that stuff 
in your neighborhood. You know, that's that's the last thing you want to be around. And uh, you know, the, that's one of the deterrents to have it have it being invested in. There's a great documentary that's available, widely available on the on about Pruitt, St. Louis's Pruitt Igloo project. Oh, uh, yeah, Pruitt it's, I go. Notorious Pruitt, and it yeah. tells the true story how it was a real community until the government stopped funding it. And then it was like, the tenants are all bad people. It was a racial demonization, an extreme racial demonization that they got away with under Democrats, as well as Republicans. It was bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Someone brought up a question that's really interesting to me. What are your thoughts on the role of hopes, the Hope Six, the Clinton's Hope Six program and its effect on housing? Because I remember when Hope Six was being rolled out, and I particularly a lot of members of uh, the black political class were cheerleading Hope Six. I know Charlie Rangel in New York was a big big advocate of Hope Six, and major urban areas uh, were a big uh, big fans of Hope Six. But what I find interesting is that after the Hope Six initiative, that's actually when you start to see some of the really early patterns of gentrifications gentrification is starting to develop in these cities. Now, you would know better than I. I was wondering, is there a correlation? Is there, is there a correlation well, or causal effect? But absolutely. I really would like you to talk about the co the connection well, between Hope 6, which was a Clinton program, and the development of gentrification in these urban areas. Well, Pruitt Igo was an example of how they demolished public housing to gentrify the area. I mean, the assumption was if you have a, it's totally false because there's a public housing project it used to be called Valencia Gardens. It might still be that on Valencia Street in Guerrero in the in the Mission District in a very upscale area. And public housing has not affected real estate values at all. But there's the perception that if we could just get rid of that public housing, like demolish it. And you make a very important point about people like Charles Rangel, who also, I think, supported the crime bill of 94. Yes, he did. Black Caucus yes, he did. Bill. You know, I understand when you're in that position, you have to make tough decisions and when there's not a lot of resources. And I think what happened with, not think, I know what happened with Hope Six is that someone like Rangel figures, hey, public housing is not going to survive. This is the only way we can get the money. But it was pointed out at the time, it was being negotiated and, and dealt with that they would potentially destroy 100,000 units. That was contemplated. That wasn't like, oh, oh, we did this and look what happened. It was contemplated. So, Pascal, when you're planning on destroying 100,000 units, why would you do that if not to gentrify surrounding neighborhoods? What would be your motive? Wow. So what you're saying is that the destruction of those public housing units via Hope 6 basically creates the spacing motivation to allow that gentrification and development of new properties that are going to be tailored to more affluent residents. Right. And the tragedy of it is that there's a lot of articles and things written about this. It doesn't, it's not true that public housing brings down adjacent property values. You know, the whole history of public housing is a tragedy because public housing was intentionally destroyed by the real estate industry as a competition. You know, if you look at other countries, they have social housing and they don't have any of the issues. Oh, it's very anti-communist. There's a, there's a lot of, before even McCarthyism, there was an anti-communist sentiment in even the uh, teardown of Chavez Ravine. Well, the New Deal, from the very start, there was opposition to public housing. After the National Housing Act passed in 1949, from the very beginning, they were attacking it and stopping it from being built. So the real estate industry never stopped trying to stop public housing. And then when Nixon killed it, the problem was that there were Democrats who had complaints from their district. They were fine. Fine, we don't. We're not going to defend public housing because it's failed. It's a it's a failed liberal experiment. That's what they all called it. When in fact it was extremely successful until real estate interests got it defunded. Even I mean, NICA in New York City, which used to be held up as the gold standard of public housing, they didn't provide heat for what like eighteen months. They had no heat, no elevators. In New York City, where they built on top of everything. Yeah. What, what's what's fascinating to me is when I when I found out about the story of Chavez Ravine. You know the the original. Uh, so years before even Dodger Stadium is built, uh, it's this ramshackle homemade area of mostly uh, Mexican residents 
and there was a plan to actually build public housing, parks, I think even a school. And this is like they built their own housing. Like there was no plumbing line. So we're talking open trenches of sewers. There's no garbage, but they did have mail delivery. Um, and the city was going to build this housing. So they bought the houses from the people for under market, under market. So they couldn't go immediately to the areas near them because there were still uh, racist covenants on deeds. And they were kind of stuck. The ones that did sell, a few stayed. I think a few hundred or so stayed. The city ends up bulldozing those houses for the stadium. Yeah, my recollection is the redevelopment agency took land by and Chavez Arena by eminent domain. At the end. And then, and then they used it to build a baseball stadium. Yeah. It was supposed to be for housing. You know, Chavez Ravine is one of those stories that got written out. It, it, it was blacked out. If you look at the LA Times coverage of, of that whole thing, they were so excited to get a stadium and the Dodgers to come. They just, it was a, it was a, it was a disgraceful. Did you know coverage. they were part of the, the communist uh, red baiting, the LA Times? Did you know that? Oh, LA Times has a terrible history. Yeah, they were, they were part of, they, oh, no. they blacklisted the architect so bad that he had to like stop being an architect because they called him a communist and he was not, he was not a communist by any stretch of the imagination. They were just trying to build housing, but that was well, the, you know, what's interesting is many newspapers, you know, they, they, they funded by the real estate, historically funded by real estate ads and they serve the real estate industry's agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really a problem. You know, Seattle times is very anti-housing uh, any, you know, and, and so that's been a problem when, it comes to endorsements, these newspapers endorse the pro real estate candidate. It's, you know, someone's bringing up another really fascinating thing about Chicago is about how public housing was destroyed in Chicago. Also around, ironically, around the same time as the neoliberal Clinton age, uh, you know, politicians are taking sway in America and in, into the millennium. And, I was reading an article that explained how the destruction of public housing in Chicago has a direct correlation to the increase of violent crime and homicides in Chicago that we've seen in the last two years, because what it did is that it basically caused all the traditional hierarchies of the gangs that have been kind of respected as this turf is here, don't cross there, to be destroyed and it caused rival competing factions to have to, you know, interact with each other in a way that proliferated the increase of violent crime. I was wondering, I don't know if you are familiar with that. I am. I do want to mention before we break that, you know, I've spent my whole career for 40 years working in San Francisco's Tenderloin. When I got to the Tenderloin in 1980, everybody said it was guaranteed on the track for gentrification. We're between Union Square and City Hall. And 40 years later, we're still a very low-income community. And I wrote a book called The Tenderloin, Sex, Crime, and Resistance in the Heart of San Francisco that is available from AK Press uh, online. And, and I think people who want to know how you can stop gentrification when it seems inevitable, look at what we did in the Tenderloin, because we did a lot of things. Uh, and I wish I, I wrote a book also, The Activist Handbook, that's strategies for stopping gentrification, because a lot of things can happen. It's hard when public housing is involved because the political power is so great and they take power away, they give it to redevelopment agencies, which are undemocratic. There's a lot of strategies the adversaries, our opposition uses, but there's strategies we have also at our disposal that many communities don't use. So we have to be a little str very strategic in combating these real threats of gentrification and displacement. Well, Randy, are you going to be joining us on the, the bonus uh, patron half uh, for another? Can we get another at least 20 minutes out of you? Because we've got a couple more questions we want to ask. About, how about 15? We will work? we will squeeze fifteen solid minutes of non bullshittery, okay, out of you, and I, and I appreciate your time so much. That's okay. Um, so put a pin in your question, Pascal. I see you pissed off now because I had to put a pin in it. Look at you. No, I'm not pissed off at all. I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm really glad. I'm really glad we have we had Randy on. I think we just had a high powered hour. We touched a lot of a lot of a lot of bases and. Even though we've had Randy on three times, we got to have him on again to really parse out 
these solutions to these complex questions around housing, gentrification, because one of the things I like about his book is that he gives really tangible solutions addressing these problems. And, you know, as someone, you know, I, I worked in real estate, I had a real estate practice. And now I, 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 when people ask me a solution to gentrification, I always say, I'll be very honest with you. This is a very complex, <laughs> complex got ask issue, question. <laughs> and I really don't know what the silver bullet is to, uh, to address this, but, uh, Randy's book is chock full of solutions on how to address these problems. One of the things he says is you got to stop single family housing zoning. Next, you got to have, uh, you know, affordable housing built into legislation, you know, which means, um, you know, price control on housing. I mean, I'll, I'll, there's quite a few things he talks about, and it's very, very important. No, I was not a real estate agent at a real estate. <laughs> also, if for Bay Area people watching this show, and I know there's a there's a good amount of Bay Area people watching the show. Randy, what is the name of your organization? The Tenderloin Housing Clinic. Are you accepting any volunteers at all? We don't really use volunteers, but people couldn't, you know, we when we have campaigns, people want to support. I also write for beyondcron.org regularly, be beyond chron.org, write about politics, housing, the whole bit. Every you know, once a week on Tuesdays, people should could subscribe to that. Uh, you know, I th I think that uh, housing is a big issue. Well, I should come back on your show once we if we win this battle in D.C. because this would be historic. I would be writing about it because you know one thing I say in the activist handbook: there are some times when activists do everything right and don't win. Right? I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. winning, you can all you can do as an activist is make sure you do everything right, and this has been a phenomenal campaign to get this money. Uh, you know, and and again, some of these New York City guys, Richie Torres has been very involved in leading it in Congress. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries, who's generally not that progressive, but it has taken is he's the fourth you know, one of the real leader, one of the leaders in in Congress. Every step, everything has been done to maximize pressure to get this money and. We have to get it because we're never going to, how can we stop homelessness? If we don't spend the money to house affordable housing. No, you're right. And on that note, everybody, we are going into the bonus patron end. So I'm going to send you a new link, Randy. Oh, okay. So we're going to leave with chill music and cartoons are for patrons. So 